Welcome back to Long Covid Doctor, an educational series for sufferers of Long Covid. This is the second part on pain and Long Covid. In the first part, I talked about the symptoms, diagnosis, investigations, and I covered the many causes of Long Covid pain. In this part, part two, I will talk about the treatments, management and outcomes. References, links and resources are in the show notes below. And as I said before, any advice, diagnoses, treatments that I mention should only be considered after discussion with your own GP or qualified health professional. So, what are the specific treatments available for pain in long COVID? There are treatments for individual pain conditions themselves, such as headache, chest pain, joint pain, etc., etc. And there are treatments for the underlying long COVID processes that are causing those pains. So, firstly, I'll cover the treatments for the individual pain conditions themselves. Firstly, headache and migraine. If these are occurring frequently on more than a few days a week, as long as they, as long as we're happy with the diagnosis, preventative treatment is needed. And I cover this in detail in my talk on headache, but in brief, Initial treatment is with standard migraine prevention treatment, usually with amitriptyline started at 10 milligrams at night. If this is ineffective or not tolerated, other drugs drugs can be considered, such as topiramate, um, cantosartan. Patients may also gain benefit from supplementation purchased from the chemist. So there's riboflavin, which is vitamin B2. This is actually mentioned in the NICE guidelines for treatment of headache. And then there's magnesium, um, purchased as magnesium citrate. Note that there are a number of different magnesium salts, so look out for magnesium citrate. But also the coenzyme Q10 and feverfew herbal remedies have been noted to be that's a, actually coenzyme Q10 is a supplement for few you as a herbal remedy. Um, these have been shown in studies to have benefit in recurrent migraine. But please obviously always be cautious with herbal supplements, especially if you're taking medication such as blood thinning medicines, such as aspirin, clopidogrel, or warfarin. So always check with your GP first. So that's headache and migraine pain. So what about chest pains? So as I said earlier, this is more complicated as it depends on the nature and the underlying cause of the chest pain. We must be totally confident uh, with the diagnosis before proceeding. This means a thorough history and examination to exclude serious cardiovascular and respiratory causes for the chest pain, i.e. to rule out heart disease, angina pain, pulmonary embolism, pericarditis, and to be backed up with relevant investigations and maybe even a specialist opinion. So as long as those worrying diagnoses have been ruled out, the remaining causes of chest pain that can be put down to long COVID is pleuritis. Classic, generalised, bilateral, both sides, COVID chest grip, as described by our patients. Pleuritis is inflammation of the lung lining on both sides, so bilaterally, which is part of the excessive inflammatory response in long COVID. The drug that can ease this is colchicine. This was first used by cardiologists for pericarditis pain, i.e. pain due to inflammation of the cardiac heart sac lining. They then 
experimented with using it for excessive inflammation of the lung sacs, the pleura, and they found it to be beneficial. Colchicine is a drug that we're all familiar with, uh, us GPs, um, all familiar with using in acute gout, um, as is licensed for. And we've been using it. It's been around for years and years. And so we know through experience that it is safe and effective in treating inflammation. The only troublesome side effect that is well documented with colchicine is a change of bowel habit. And that means diarrhea, loose, loose bowel actions, diarrhea. And this is often a reason to discontinue it. But it's worth a try. And in our clinics, we, we certainly have had many patients thank us for suggesting it to take away their COVID chest grip. As I said before, I cover all this in much greater detail on my chest pain talk. So that's head pain, migraine, chest pain done. Joint pains. This may be part of an exacerbation of underlying osteoarthritis. So degenerative wear and tear, joint pain, and hence treatment with anti-inflammatory drugs such as ibuprofen would be indicated. That would be the obvious first line drug to take as long as, you know, our patient, as long as you don't have that any tendency for indigestion and that you're not on any other medications that might interact with it. The other more serious cause for joint pain is an active inflammation process, such as rheumatoid arthritis, one of the autoimmune diseases in which your own immune system is attacking your own cartilage, joint lining. Telltale signs for this, signs that would make us suspicious of this type of acute active inflammatory disease process would be joint swelling and red, redness uh, as, long, as well as um, along with early morning joint stiffness. Um, the GP would want to be sending bloods for inflammatory markers such as the CRP and ferritin. Those will be in, elevated in inflammatory joint disease and the rheumatoid factor and the ANA factor would also probably be positive, which would then confirm the diagnosis. If this is the case, referral for a rheumatological opinion is needed. So our rheumatologist colleagues need to be involved so that active treatment can be started if it does prove to be active joint disease to prevent irres irreversible joint damage. So that's joint pains done, leading on from that into muscle pains. Muscle pains may be due to a virus, the virus, as in SARS-CoV-2 virus, destroying muscle cells in the acute infection, the myocytes. This leads to pain, sort of inflammatory pain, as well as reduced muscle function due to reduced mitochondria, the little energy energy factories in ourselves not working properly or less of them. And so less aerobic, and if, there's, if, if there are less mitochondria and there's less aerobic energy production of ATP, and therefore there's going to be more anaerobic energy production and a byproduct of that process, anaerobic respiration, is the buildup of lactic acid. And that's uncomfortable and often painful. There are also there is also another condition that is characterized by painful muscles, namely fibromyalgia. This presents with non-specific muscle pains following no particular pattern for no obvious reason. 
It's a diagnosis by exclusion, also made by the rheumatologists, having done all the necessary tests to exclude other causes. Treatment of this condition is difficult and but also necessary to improve sort of general function as well as the control of the symptoms. And then on to nerve pain. Having done joint pain, muscle pain, let's go on to nerve pain. This may be individual pains in ra at random, unconnected, unconnected parts of the body, typically in the arms and the legs. There may be pins and needles, skin sensations like ants crawling on the skin or numbness. Your GP may want to send you for nerve conduction studies, but also ask for blood tests for vitamin B12 and folate, as well as HbA1c to check for diabetes. Nerve pain may be due to localized inflammation in the tissues themselves, or small fiber neuropathy, a condition called small fiber neuropathy, I reduced function of the small sensory nerves, as well as the autonomic nerves that control blood flow under the skin. Nerve, nerve pain also can be also due to problems in the brain stem, due to effects in the pain center there, leading to excessive or inappropriate firing of the nerve fibers in the pain center, or as explained earlier, due to pain, central pain sensitization, allodynia, the perception of pain from non-painful stimuli. And finally, nerve pain confined to one side of the face may be due to a condition called trigeminal neuralgia your GP no, will know all about this and will be able to treat you for this. But in general, nerve pain, neuropathic pain, is very complicated. However, the drugs that are indicated for nerve pain, neuropathic pain, are amitriptyline initially, and I talked about this already, already for migraine prevention and also for chronic recurrent headaches. But just one word though, um, amitriptyline has been used for at least 50 years. It was the first antidepressant. But none of us use it for that reason anymore. And the reason I'm saying it is that I have had patients say that they feel offended that when I've put them on amitriptyline, an antidepressant, the patient comes back to me and says, he thinks I'm depressed. No, it's not true. It's only used for neuropathic pain and migraine prevention these days. We have far better antidepressants with no side effects and no dependency um, compared with compared with amitriptyline. No, it's not depression. If amitriptyline is not tolerated, there are other alternatives. There's pregabalin, there's gabapentin, there's duloxetine. Again, your GP will be familiar with these, and so it's down to the GP. If, despite all this, the pain is not responding, it's still really troublesome, I think it's entirely reasonable for a referral to a neurologist to be requested. Um, because, you know, at that point, I would be thinking, well, maybe there are further investigations that need to be done, such as scans, thinking nerve root compression, to search for other diagnoses. So, finally, on to abdominal pain. Probably the commonest cause for this is the effect of COVID on the enteric nervous system. What is the enteric nervous system? Basically, it's the, in it's the nervous system that is that is attached to is serving the gut for release of digestive enzymes 
and muscular contractions, the waves of peristalsis, the peristaltic waves that push the food along the intestines. If this is disrupted due to a faulty autonomic nervous system, this leads to bowel muscle spasm and colic and bloating and distension, and these can all be very painful. Specific treatment for this is with antispasmodic medicines from your GP, such as mebeverin or peppermint oil. Obviously, if there are other associated symptoms, such as a change in bowel habit, you must see your GP for advice to rule out other more sinister causes. Remember what I said in part one, we must not be COVID blind. Just because you've had COVID, it doesn't mean that your symptom is due to COVID. It may be something else, something more serious and totally unrelated to your COVID. So, before I conclude this section, I just wanted to mention one other thing, one other drug that you may have read about in the long COVID forums or heard about amongst other colleagues or or friends, acquaintances in the long COVID community. And that is the drug known as long low-dose naltrexone. The drug is no no naltrexone, but given in a low dose. Currently, low-dose naltrexone is not listed in the NICE guidelines for long COVID and hence not recommended. However, having said that, many patients are sourcing this privately from chemists and online and reporting that it's really effective for pain relief in long COVID. There are small random controlled trials of low-dose nitrexone in multiple sclerosis, HIV, ME-CFS, fibromyalgia and Crohn's disease that actually indeed do show its effectiveness. And in rheumatoid arthritis and Crohn's disease, it, patients who are trialed with it have been able to reduce their, their disease-modifying drugs. Low-dose naltrexone um, in the higher dose, or sorry, put it another way, naltrexone in the usual higher dose um, for its license use, and that is to help patients with opiate addiction, is very well tolerated. Um, and its use in those conditions, well tolerated and with you know very few side effects. That's the high dose. Its use for those conditions, like I mentioned earlier, like the MS and the MECFS and fibromyalgia, as well as long COVID, is in low dose, low dose naltrexone. And when I say low dose, it's a tenth of the tenth of the dose. Okay, so it's it's lower by a factor of ten. And so side effects are rare in the higher dose. They're even rarer in the lower dose and usually short-lived and usually occurring at a time when the dosage, dosage, the the amount you're giving has been increased. The side effects that are listed um, are insomnia and vivid dreams, but the other two are headache and nausea. But like I said, they're quite low, they're quite sort of, quite, quite rare. So my advice, what's my advice? My advice would be to discuss this with your GP, your own GP, who obviously knows you, your knows your whole story, knows other medications, sees, will be able to see the whole picture, um, longitudinally. If you're contemplating buying it for yourself, to check, you you must always, you know, make sure that, um, that you do check 
with someone such as your GP that you're not missing something, another cause for your symptoms. And, you know, obviously always be really wary of buying medicines, medications, supplements online because of all their associated possible dangers. So meanwhile, patients are getting information with about long COVID from LDN Research Trust. Maybe worth googling that if you want some more information on it. And so, as I said, at this point in time, currently, we're not recommending low dose naltrexone, um, as stated in the NICE guidelines on long COVID management. But I have to say, we're eagerly awaiting any results from research studies that will hopefully demonstrate that it's both safe and effective. So that's low-dose naltrexone. So there we are. The treatments. What have I covered? I've, treat- I've covered the treatments for individual pain conditions themselves, such as the headache, the chest pain. Uh, joint pains, etc., etc. Now I want to talk more on the treatments for underlying long COVID processes that are causing those pains and those painful conditions, namely the damaged tissues, the overactive inflammatory system, the faulty immune system, the damaged autonomics, and disrupted friendly gut bacteria. So firstly, the excessive inflammatory response. I mentioned that right at the start, didn't I? And remember what I said, it's not only the cytokine storm, but the micro micro thrombi, the mini clots, but it's also part of the excessive inflammatory response is mast cell activation. It is worth treating this to see if it makes a difference with the pain level. I cover this in great detail in my MCAS talk, but basically this is with the use of H1 blocker, the antihistamine drug such as cetirizine, along with the the H2 blocker, the anti-acid drug, stomach acid drug, famotidine, in combination. It should also be noted that prescription of these medicines for long COVID, particularly at a dose greater than once a day, is off-label, meaning that it's not covered by the UK product license. The patient should be aware of this and seek medical advice and supervision, especially if increasing doses are being considered. If you are taking those H1, H2 blockers um, and the symptoms improve with those medicines, they could be continued for up to three months, say, and then discontinued at that point. See what happens. If the symptoms return at that point, you know, patients are probably going to say, actually, I think I would like to restart them and probably run them for another three months and then discontinue them again to see whether the symptoms return. If they returned, obviously, like I've said, restart the pills. If the symptoms don't return, there's no point in restarting the pills. The problem has passed. That's, that would be fantastic. That would be everyone's hope. And so, what else can we do to help the recovery from long COVID? Well, it's really important to take, to take the whole person view, the holistic view. We need to think about nutrition and sleep and mind-body. So, first of all, nutrition, our diet. Preferably, we should be having a mixed, balanced diet, a Mediterranean diet, the famous Mediterranean diet, that contains all the necessary minerals and vitamins, the building blocks for cellular tissue repair. It also contains anti-inflammatory, antioxidant um, uh, chemicals, the polyphenols, those chemicals that make your fruit the oranges and the yellows and the blues and the blacks and the greens, Um, the polyphenols, the antioxidants that mop up those naughty naughty free radicals. 
And then the Mediterranean diet also contains prebiotic fiber to nourish the microbiota, the friendly gut bacteria. I covered this more fully in my talk on long COVID gut. A healthy gut flora is so important for immune support, production of vitamins, hormones, neurotransmitter chemicals. And then there's also omega-3 fish oils to consider. Uh, it'd be great if you get this in your a mixed balanced diet by eating fish, fatty, fatty fish, such as salmon or mackerel, sardines, a couple of times a week. Omega, they contain lots of omega-3 essential fatty acids, also really important for so many functions, but in particular, support of the immune system. And then vitamin D for good measure. We live high up in the northern hemisphere here in the UK. Um, we're relatively UVB uh, starved, especially in the winter months. So think about vitamin D. Why not? So that's nutrition, the diet dealt with. Really important to consider. But also sleep. Sleep's really important to consider as well. So what do we say? Sleep is the great healer. That's what we say, isn't it? Sleep is necessary for, you know, ref for the big refresh as well as the big repair. We must support the day-night cycle, the circadian rhythm, for release of various restorative hormones, such as growth hormone. We've got to think about sleep hygiene, strict bedtime, strict get-up time, get an alarm clock, um, sleep-inducing novel if you can't get to sleep, not mobiles and screens, tablets, right up to bedtime, right up to lights out. No, for the hour before you turn the light on, read that sleep-inducing Jane Austen novel, not use your screen, because mobiles and screens emit blue light, which is arousing, uh, not unlike sort of red or pink light, which is more relaxing. To help with sleep, a number of patients, some patients use Pyroton, the sedating old-fashioned ancient antihistamine. Um, there are studies to show that magnesium encourages normal sleep, enhancing, has enhancing properties as does melatonin. Again, lots of patients are taking melatonin, the the um, three milligram rapid onset or the two milligram slow onset circadian. Um, I talk about this more in my, um, in my uh, presentation on sleep disturbance in long COVID. So that's diet done, sleep done. But it's also important to tackle worries, turbo brain, I've put it, I, I, des I describe it as turbo brain, too many, too much thinking, and anxieties, worries. These all lead to fight and flight, and adrenaline, sympathetic nervous system overdrive. We need to address these. So the way we can address them is by considering mind-body techniques, such as mindfulness, meditative, meditative mindfulness. That's a tongue twister. Meditative mindfulness. So you can learn this by using the apps Headspace or Calm. Download it to, the, to your phone. Really useful. Not too expensive and really good for guided mindfulness. And there are many studies that back up the validity and the effectiveness and the benefits of mindfulness for stress relief, for anxiety reduction. And also thinking mind-body techniques, think about um, yoga and tai chi. Um, again, mind and body, proven in studies to help with stress and anxiety and dropping blood pressure. And these, these practices incorporate focus and breath control and coordination and general body reconditioning. Definitely worth considering. And then finally, 
as part of the whole long COVID management, we must apply the fatigue management strategies. That is pacing, planning, prioritizing, the three P's. Pacing, the process of balancing activity, that is physical, mental, as well as emotional activity. Balancing those activities with rest. Pacing gives you awareness of limitations. Knowing your limitations so you can plan how you use your energy most efficiently and effectively is so important. Pacing means no more push on through. It's stop. That's enough. Time out. I need a rest. And then I'll restart what I'm doing. I cover this in much greater detail in my talk on long COVID and fatigue. So, besides all this advice, there are a few trusted resources for long COVID recovery. There's your COVID recovery, which is a, which is the sort of the NHS England website, self-treatment patient resource for symptoms and information and self-management. And then there's the Royal College of Occupational Therapists, who have got an excellent bank of resources. But the one I think is really good is, is basically how to manage post-viral fatigue. I've put the, the links to both of those in the show notes below. So there we are. Um, that concludes the second part of my talk on pain and long COVID, following on from the first part earlier. I hope you found them helpful. Uh, as I mentioned at the start, any advice, diagnoses, treatments that I mention in either of these talks or any of my many talks should only be considered after discussion with your own GP or qualified health professional. So, uh, in the meantime, I wish you well. I wish you well in your long COVID recovery and cheerio. Bye.